meeting number 12 of the Cape Elizabeth <coughs> Town Council. It is Monday, September 13th, 2010. Could we have the roll call by the town clerk, please? Chair Swift Kayata. Here. Council Guvenali. Here. Council Jordan. Here. Council Lennon. Here. Council Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. And Councilor Walsh. Here. The pledge, please join me. Town Council reports and correspondence. Is there anyone who would like to report? Jessica? I'd like to remind the Council and the general public that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock the Conservation <coughs> Commission Committee will be meeting in the Jordan Conference Room, followed at 8 o'clock by the Open Space Management Committee. The public is welcome as always. And I'd like to report to the Council that the Open Space Management Committee is on target to provide a draft outline to the Council by September 30 as, as its current charge. Thank you. Any? Uh, yes, I wanted to remind people, I mentioned this at the last council meeting, but this coming, uh, I think it's this, no, it's the 25th, this month goes so fast. <coughs> um, the 25th of September um, at Eco Maine, they're having their open house, and I really, 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 really want to encourage people to go and, um, and attend this this um, open house, and it's from 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 um, a.m., and uh, there's going to be a lot of activities, but I think one of the uh, neatest things is to really get a tour of the single sort and really see what happens when you're um, recycling uh, your silver bullets show up there. And also there's going to be uh, education around composting, but it's an activity for the whole family. So I really want to encourage people to attend. Thank you. Dave? Uh, I also want to remind folks that the Municipal Operations Review Committee is continuing its work, and our next meeting is Thursday, uh, September 23rd at 7 p.m. And Mike, is that meeting in the town hall? Yes, it is. Okay, at the town hall. Back the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Anyone on this side? No? Um, uh, the only thing I wanted to say was th I wanted to thank everyone who attended our workshop on land use. Um, amendments and planning on, nine, on September 7th. It was not televised, but uh, we had a good turnout, so thank you. And we will be continuing to work on those issues, including uh, discussing some of them tonight. Um, the tonight, uh, now we have the first of our opportunities for uh, the citizens to speak uh, or discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. If there's anyone who would like to speak on one of those items, please come forward to the podium. And seeing no one, we will move on to the town manager's report. Yes, thank you, Chair Swiftcat. I want to speak very briefly uh, on an email that went out about a month ago to a lot of people in Cape Elizabeth. And I, and I could go into a lot of the details of the email, and I don't want to do that this evening. But I do want to mention one one piece that was mentioned as a fact in that particular email. It, it mentioned that the town council, the town, was continuing to waste money, and specifically for a $750,000 ladder truck, uh, hook and ladder truck, it said. You know, the, 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 the true fact is, is that the town has one ladder truck, it's 17 years old, and it costs $343,000, not $750,000. You know, and there's many other parts of some of these emails and other comments you read elsewhere that sometimes are, f are far from the actual reality. So I'd just encourage folks, when they read things and they don't seem to be believable, uh, or they just seem so far off, I'd really encourage anyone to check for um, other information. Uh, if, it, if it isn't believable, it probably isn't. So, you know, it's a $343,000 truck not a $750,000 truck, and it's uh, not something continuing to waste money. It was purchased 17 years ago. Uh, you know, rarely the, the, the facts are so far off. And, you know, and partly as a result of that, one of our volunteer firefighters was at a fire down in Shore Acres a week or so ago, and the ladder truck was being used, 
and a citizen came up to them and said, oh, it's the first time it's being used all year. Uh, you know, probably not the best approach to one of our volunteer firefighters when they're at a fire scene. Uh, but, you know, in particular, you know, if you look at that ladder truck, you look at that it's a 40-year vehicle, yes, it needs work every so often as it, as it will in a couple of years when it's, when it's 20 years old. Uh, you know, it's still, you know, I can remember seeing that ladder truck down at Fulton Headlight one day when it was extended over the rocks right next to the lighthouse, and actually the, the fire department wet team was able to lift someone up out of where the tide was coming in. Uh, and actually was saved by that ladder truck, as well as the, the great dedication of our wet team members. Uh, you know, yeah, we can share vehicles as we do. With South Portland has a number of ladder trucks. But, you know, it, I just think it, it's sad that our, particularly our fire volunteers, are being approached while at fire scenes, complaining about a ladder truck, in part based on erroneous information. And again, I could go into lots of other things that I've read recently that, that just aren't true, but that one particularly concerned me because I saw immediate results from it in terms of what happened at that fire scene. So just want to mention that and again, encourage everyone as they read different things uh, to, you know, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and look for uh, some additional information. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, the minutes of the meeting held August 9th. Do I hear a motion? I move to accept the August 9th minutes um, as read. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any amendments or, com or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Next, we have a public, we have scheduled a public comment period uh, having to do, this is required by state law, state law um, having to do with the liquor license renewal of Rudy's of the Cape. And so if there is anyone who would, our next item, item 106, will have to do with the, uh, the li their license renewal. So if there's anyone who would like to come forward and comment on their uh, license renewal. If you could please come forward to uh, the podium there where there's a microphone and state your name and address. We would appreciate it. I see no one coming forward. So uh, I guess the public comment section is over. And we will move on to item number 106. <coughs> Rudy's of the Cape liquor license renewal. Penny, did you want to make a motion? I would. Uh, Penny, excuse me. Um, I passed oh, the yeah. chair, but um, I'd like to recuse myself from this deliberation. I have a business relationship with an abutter, and I do not believe I should sit on the decision relative to this license application. Okay, so you're you're requesting to uh, the, the council to recuse you. Okay, we'll take that as. As a motion, is there a sec I'll second that. Um, all in, is there any discussion? All in favor of Jim Walsh recusing himself from this discussion and vote. Six, and Jim is abstaining. So, thank you, Jim. I'm sorry I forgot to uh, mention that. Now, now, Penny. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion that. Um, we accept the application by Rudy's for their uh, liquor license. And um, I know that there was an, an email that uh, we received regarding uh, numbers that might be on this application. And I uh, spoke with the owners of uh, Rudy's, the managers of Rudy's, and we have identified uh, what numbers should be represented. The percentage of liquor to food is, is still within the boundary. So what I would like to do is make a motion that we uh, accept this uh, renewal, uh, holding it until the numbers are updated and we keep those for public record. 
uh, but we allow Rudy's to move forward with their liquor license once those requests for food and liquor are updated. And did you want to say by a certain date I within? Say, uh, it should be by, I would say within the next, a reasonable time would be within the next three to five days. I mean, it shouldn't take that long to. Yeah. We, we, we actually got the updated numbers this evening at the beginning of the meeting. Good. Uh, okay. They just need to be incorporated onto the form by the applicant. Okay. Okay. So, okay. okay. Um, is there a second? I'll second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Jessica. Could you just, just re-explain, just review that for me? What you're, we're allowing them to continue until the up numbers are updated, and then we, do we revisit them, or do we just? They're, they're going to be updated. And then the, uh, the updates will be available for public record. I don't think the council needs to review them again as long as we um, accept that the, their liquor license should be accepted or will be accepted and that the numbers need to be updated. And Mike, uh, uh, the town manager has already said he's received those updated numbers. So. So the, so the motion is to approve, to approve the renewal of the liquor license pending our receipt of the updated numbers, which we hear we've already gotten. Exactly. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, I have one more question. Um, I just, I'm really in favor of this in spirit. I just, I just hate to vote on something when I don't know what the numbers are. Are the numbers in keeping with what they should be, Mike? The food number is 503,919, and the beer and wine number is 68,929. Thank you. You're all set. Dave? I had the exact same concern that uh, Jessica had, um, and it seems to me that those numbers, based on my anecdotal evidence, would be sort of more than what I would expect. So I'm a lot more comfortable now approving this uh, application for renewal. Okay. Any other comments on this side? No? Okay. Um, it's been moved and seconded and discussed. All in favor? Six. And there's, it's unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much. Next, we are moving on to a public hearing on some amendments to our tree ordinance. Uh, I don't know if we need to give much background on this. This was a draft that was recommended by our, the Council's Ordinance Committee in June. And um, what else do we need to say about it, Mike? The, the, the changes are pretty insignificant. We've seen these before. I just needed to make sure we went through the proper form and had the public hearing. So um, if there's anyone who would like to come forward uh, to make uh, to the public hearing on the tree ordinance amendments, please step forward to the podium. I'll declare the public hearing open. Okay, no one for that public hearing either. Um, so moving forward to item 107, the tree ordinance. Do I hear, uh, yes? A motion. A motion. I would move that we adopt the amendments to the tree ordinance. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are, are there any comments or is there discussion? Jessica? I have uh, just two. And one is just more of a, a typo. And I was wondering on section uh, the second part of section 1835, tree permits required. Um, <clears throat> work may be done so long as the tree warden is informed thereof within two days. I'm wondering if that ought to be two business days. That would be fine. Would that be okay? Where, where, I'm sorry, which, which page? Are you um, it's page three, top paragraph. Oh, okay. Just to, instead of saying two days to two yep. business days. And business days is used elsewhere. Okay. And I just thought it, it's clear, just so there's no. And the only other comment I had 
and I is I wondered on the the last page on section eighteen three seven uh, Nothing sh in this section shall be pro shall be or prohibit. There's a little typo there. Anyone from relocating or cutting a public tree that has fallen on a designated Cape Elizabeth Greenbelt Trail, would it be um, prudent to add and shall do so at their own risk? I was just it's just a thought. I mean, I don't, you know. Council would like it. It's no problem. I'm, and get I'm rid of the word B as well. I have no opinion with yeah. this. And I'd get right. rid of the word B. And the B, yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or changes? Just a thank you to Bob Malley and the tree warden for the work that they did on this. Yes. It was the work that they did to try to clean this thing up after we've had ample tree damage over a period of time <laughs> needing to make sure that, it, that the, the ordinance reflects what is uh, required. Okay. I um, am going to go back to uh, Dave. Wh whoever made the uh, motion, will you accept those changes as friendly amendments? Uh, yes. And whoever seconded? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. It's been moved and seconded as amended. Uh, all in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have another public hearing, uh, which has to do with some um, the council wanting to get input from citizens on the potential for a paper throw option method of dealing with trash um, and also uh, you know basically anything else that's on your mind about trash recycling getting rid of waste we're sort of open to, to hearing it all um, the the rules for public hearings participation at public hearings uh, are, are laid out in the agenda. I hope there were a pile of agendas in the back, but basically uh, we ask people if they'd like to speak to please come up uh, when the public hearing is open. We ask them to come up, uh, speak uh, at the podium because there's a microphone there. Please state your name and your address, your local affiliation if there's something relevant about your local affiliation. Uh, we put a time limit of three minutes on um, each person so that everybody gets a chance to speak. So if you have something on your mind having to do with paper bag, paper throw, recycling, trash, whatever, now's your chance. So I'll declare this public hearing open and whoever wants to come up just, it, it helps maybe if you, you know, two or three people can line up if we're going to have a whole bunch. You don't have to have a long line but it will help. I've got a little timer here and I will try to politely give you the word if you're going over yeah. <laughs> if you're going over three minutes. Thank you very much sir. Yes, go ahead please. My name is uh, Richard Berman. I live on Hannaford Cove Road. Um, and my thoughts on this are um, it, my concern is that it could be a hidden tax. Um, unless it's tied to a tax decrease, in other words, all the money that's raised by selling bags goes to decrease our taxes, that'd be great. Um, but it doesn't feel like that's part of it. So to me, it starts to look, feel, and smell like another hidden tax, or like a hidden tax. And I would ask the council, if that's the case, to um, just uh, make it still pay for it uh, with our taxes. That's part of the services that we pay for. And then man up and woman up to the fact that, okay, here's the cost. Maybe we need to spend less maintaining Fort Williams because we've got to balance a budget. So what I'm suggesting is unless it's tied to a decrease in tax, don't make it a hidden tax. Deal with it. That's what we elect you for, to be good stewards of our money. So don't burden us with any hidden taxes, please. The 
The second thing that I raise is <coughs> sort of the unintentional consequences. It sounds like a great idea, especially if there's a decrease in tax, as I said. But, and I'd n normally go along with it, but I'm seeing what's happening in Portland. Once they had the bags, now they've increased the price of the bags. I guess it's not even tied to waste disposal. It can fill any budget hole you have. Uh, but what's happening, according to, I think it was a Phoenix, I don't know if anybody else read this, um, but there's a lot of illegal dumping now in Portland. People, the, the trash bags went up, and some people are taking those things and putting them in dumpsters illegally. Other people, um, there's less sales of bags now because they're so expensive and people aren't buying them, and people aren't even selling them anymore, so it's harder to find the bags now. And there's burning barrels. So now people are starting to burn their trash. And that affects the air qualities. So before you do this, I would say, gee, think about some of these things that could happen that are happening in different towns. And the last thing I'll say is I was reading something here where it said since 2007, Cape Elizabeth has had the largest percentage increase in recycling and the largest percentage decrease and solid waste among 11 eco-main communities on a per capita basis. I know we're using more solid waste, but the trend since 2007 is great. We should pat ourselves on the back. We should pat the recycling committee on the back. I know myself, <coughs> I've read uh, Greg Walsh, you know, Kate Curry has written a lot of things about recycling. I've even started a compost heap. So my point is it's working. We've got a ways to go to be like all of other communities, but it's working. We're smart people, and I would say, before you do this, let's, the trends are such that we're recycling more and more. The committee's doing, I think, a good job. Let's continue doing that. To me, this feels like it's just a, another source of income, and I think that's wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Herbert Dennison, 63, Sperling Capital. I urge the council to leave it alone and not charge per bag. Uh, I agree with the gentleman before. It's another way of raising revenue. And, you know, I would remind the manager and the council at this time we are in a recession. We shouldn't be looking at ways to, to raise more spending. Uh, also, I can claim the taxes on my income tax. I cannot claim fees. Secondly, uh, in regards to uh, revenues, I urge the council and the manager to look at more on where we are spending our money, such as paving 77, which I believe is state maintained. Why aren't we putting this money into our own roads? Uh, or is it politics? Uh, another thing I wonder is, I, if I may be wrong, but I understand the more tonnage at the incinerator or E. coli, whatever you call it, the higher the tonnage, the cheaper the cost to operate. So therefore, if we're pushing recycling in all towns are, we're driving it up on the other hand, it looks like to me. One hand gets it, the other hand Yes, it, it looks like we're in a no-win situation. And I think the best way of finding new revenue is looking at our present revenue. I commend the council on their cooperation with the school board. I, I don't think that we're on a one-town concept. Uh, are we getting a true cost for our ground maintenance? Is there revenue there that we should be getting to help out? rather than put it pay per bag. Uh, we supposedly had a bare bones budget, but our uh, municipal side of the town saw no raises, and yet the following week after you adopted the bare bones budget of the school department, they issued a 2% increase. Uh, it's kind of a slap in the face to you, and I, I compliment you on, as I say, trying to compliment, I think, the school board needs to work closer to the town for one town concept. So 
that's it in a nutshell, and I urge that if you're going to do anything in changing it, that you put it to a referendum vote. Let okay. the people decide. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm Pat Bothell, 90 Ocean House Road. Um, my concern initially with pay per, per throw is that we're really trying to get people to recycle and compost, and now we're going to sell them plastic bags to put trash in. So we're creating a new trash stream. We're trying to get away from plastic so that we can compost and recycle, and now we're going to sell bags at a cost and add more trash to our... Yeah, they're only thin plastic bags, but it's the whole idea that you're adding more plastic, which is a negative energy source once it gets to Echo Main. Um, I really like seeing that we're recycling more and more and more. My own family does not create one trash bucket barrel a week. We're far less than that. What my chickens don't eat, we vermicompost. And I think educationally, there's a lot more that the town can do that maybe the recycling committee is working on before we take a step. I don't think this is a hidden tax. I think it's a tax. It's paying more for what we're getting already. And there may, we may need to do that, but I think that we need to exhaust every other avenue. Um, I've got questions and I don't know where I'd find the answers about whether or not we're actually recycling all the metal that we collect because metal, scrap metal prices are, are elevated right now, not quite as much now as they were, but is that just all getting hauled off? Are we paying to have it hauled? Or are we collecting money on it because it is worth something? Um, I think, I just really think there's a lot more things that we can do before we take this step. And I, I'm concerned as a business owner because we've had trouble before with people dumping trash in our hopper, in our, in our uh, dumper, dumpster that we have. Um, I think this is going to drive that up. We're seeing um, in some other communities that we've been through, we are seeing more trash in the woods and on the side of the road than we've seen before. And I mean, I, I don't know what else you can attribute that to. So th those are my concerns. I appreciate that there's a lot to weigh here, but if it's just that we're spending too much money at the dump, then I think that needs that the line item in the budget needs to increase, and we pay it so that everyone can see what it is. It's a, it is a tax. There's not a way around that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Ann Colburn. I live on uh, at 1088 Shore Road. And I moved to Cape Elizabeth about a year ago. Um, <clears throat> the two things that uh, I use the most in Cape Elizabeth are the park, the, the lighthouse, and the dump. That is, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm at both of those. Um, definitely the dump once a week at the park, hopefully more than that. And those are the two things that uh, have been sort of looked at to, to scratch away at. Um, I, don't, I don't use the school, I don't use the library, I don't use a lot of other things, but those things I, I do use. And uh, I think that I agree that the paper bag is, is a tax. And I think everybody uses the dump, you know? Just increase the line item. Let's not set up a whole other level of bureaucracy to make the bags, stamp the bags with the logos, make sure everybody has the bags, especially when you have vacation people. You're going to have mix-ups on people just trying to get rid of um, bags of stuff that aren't in the proper bag. And uh, I know downtown Portland, where I work, certain areas don't have public garbage cans anymore because in the neighborhoods, people were putting in their, their home, you know, home garbage in, in those. So, so the streets become messy because they're just not the public uh, garbage cans to alleviate the, the dumping. So uh, I wish I had a, a better answer than to say just um, raise my taxes. 
that I don't really want you to raise my taxes, <laughs> but I don't want you to, to make me pay extra for, for the two things that, uh, that I am uh, using regularly. But I thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Bruce Lockwood, Hunts Point Road. And I appreciate the opportunity to address the council on this uh, particular matter, the paper throw. And I, too, view it as a, an additional cost, an additional tax. And as uh, one of the uh, earlier gentlemen mentioned, it is a tax that we can't get any um, uh, benefit from uh, deducting from the federal income tax. But to begin with, I, I'm a devoted to recycling. I recycle everything. And when I see my kids toss recyclable items into the trash, I actually pull it out of the trash and I show it to them and educate them on the fact that we should be recycling everything. And I think the folks at the uh, transfer station couldn't have done a better job organizing the recycling uh, that we uh, can do there and making it as easy as possible. I mean, you don't even have to sort tin from glass from paperboard or anything like that. So it's exceedingly easy right now. I often comment to people who are dumping corrugated cardboard into the bin that it's really easy to just take it over to the trailers and put it into one of the trailers. So, um, so, so I, I think our recycling is about as easy as it can be to manage and I think we just have to continue educating people on it. I lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the early 90s. That's a city of 100,000 people, far bigger than the city of Portland, Maine. And we had curbside recycling and trash collection. And to me, that was a much more environmentally friendly way to encourage recycling. Cambridge at that time actually imposed fines on people that they saw were um, consciously not recycling items. And whereas that seems kind of impossible to impose, at least it's a, it's a green approach to this whole trash issue. And I'd like to see that. The state of Maine right now is trying to position itself as a leader in the green economy, yet all these towns are asking or requiring people to buy plastic bags to preserve their trash for generations to come. And that just doesn't seem to uh, align well with the green economy that Maine is trying to establish. So I encourage us to take another look at this, a more green look at this, a more environmentally sound view of this. And instead of copycatting other towns, why don't we be a leader on this issue and, and, and just become a green town through t making the kids take buses, through our recycling efforts, and really educate from the bottom up and be the green leader in southern Maine. So, I, as I say, I view this as another tax, and I think there's a more proactive way that we can take care of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Seifries, and I live at 22 Longfellow Drive. Um, my family is definitely against paper bag, or paper throw, or whatever you want to call it. Um, first of all, I feel like it unfairly targets um, families with very young children, and here's why. We recycle everything we possibly can. We compost, we recycle. But I have babies, and babies wear diapers, and diapers are not recyclable. And so I really feel that all the young families in this community, with you know babies and young children who do the absolute best that they can, are being unfairly targeted by this. Also, the less well-off people in our community, a, a bag that costs $2.50 or whatever is a higher percentage of their income than it is of somebody else's. And so again, it, it unfairly targets them. Um, I was going to bring up several things that other people have already talked about. The fact that you know we're trending very high in our recycling and we're lowering our solid waste. And I think that we are doing a great job. Um, but I'm not going to belabor points that other people have already made. Um, I would love to see just more education and maybe, I don't know if there's a little bit more stricture that could happen at the hopper where people are obviously dumping their recyclables. Maybe there's a fine imposed there or something like that. Um, but I do agree we could be a leader as a green community and, you know, and not copycat. I really liked that. Um, 
I do have friends in Falmouth who openly do go and just go to dumpsters now. They don't buy their bags and, you know, they're illegally dumping. And so I'm thinking, okay, the people at IGA, they're going to they're going to have to start paying a whole lot more because now people are going to be dumping their thing, you know, their home trash there or wherever. So I do urge the council to, you know, rethink this position and look at alternate ways of continue, continuing this, you know, great progress that we've had to decrease our cost at the dump. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Bill Desen, 11 Wainwright Drive, Cape Elizabeth. Um, a couple of points. Uh, I do have a small business in uh, town uh, of Portland, and people do dump a lot of their refuge in there, and it's uh, a problem you can only capture them on video, which costs expense, takes a lot of time to track down licenses, blah, blah, blah. Um, I came from a town before coming here that had pay for bag. Uh, I had no objection to it except that I found it very inconvenient. I had to go down to the town hall to buy the bags. Unfortunately, the town hall was closed Saturdays and Sundays, so for a working family, it was very inconvenient. They closed 4.30 during the weekday, and it was just tough doing that. It seems to me it's an inconvenience uh, to run one place and grab bags for a price and then have to refill them up and then take them off to the transfer station. Um, and as for the price, when I moved into this town uh, over a five-year period, it jumped 70 percent from three dollar per five dollar per bag, and so I was spending uh, with a family of five uh, somewhere around 500 bucks a year just in this. So I view this really as everybody has said, and I think there's no doubt about it. It's just another source of revenue and a tax to the people, just indirect, um, unless you prefer to give free bags and/or refund that. Uh, revenue stream on your tax return. Um, I do think it hurts larger families, uh, poorer families, I think that's been said, but it's the convenience factor that's really uh, not easy to live with, it's just time away from your schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is John DeMarco. I live on Shepherd's Road. Um, I won't be here too long. I have pretty much just repeated what everybody else has said. My family is definitely against the pay-per-view bag. Um, I know you have a tough job, and we do appreciate it. Um, I do think with the bag system, it is just uh, a little easier to say, oh, the bag only went up a dollar, or the bag only went up a dollar fifty, as opposed to the tax increase went up this percentage. I'd rather see it as a tax with it than, a ba than li listed as a bag fee. I think that also gives uh, more people in the general public uh, a better view of what their taxes truly are, as opposed to splitting it up as, well, this is a bag fee, this is this fee, this is my taxes. Um, it's just, you know, that's just the way I, I view one portion of it. And the rest, a lot of people have already said, I come from a large family, so we're definitely against it. And, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. I'm Carolyn Smith. I live at 41 Belfield Road. And like most of the people I've witnessed tonight, I'm opposed to paper bag. Um, I think the plastic is ugly. I don't think I've ever bought a trash bag in my life. Um, and somehow, we have a system that I think already works, and I think a lot of people are very happy with. It's really convenient. And I've noticed that there was a, I looked at the trends and there was an increase in recycling about the time that I noticed more bins out back behind here because sometimes I go and recycle more than I go to the dump. I also noticed we spend some time in Scarborough, sometimes we recycle there, and the same thing. They have this huge trend the year that they put in all these extra bins behind Hannaford. And I noticed in South Portland that they have more bins. I don't summer in South Portland, but occasionally I go past their bins. I hope that's legal to put my recycling in there. Sometimes I'm doing my errands and I just drop it off. And I would be interested to see if 0910, they have an increase in their recycling. So as long as it works, I think it should just stay the way it is. And I think um, as long as it's convenient, then it's, people are going to continue to do it. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm Phil St. Germain. I live on Channel View Road. I'd like to first point out to every one of you guys that your careers here started at the dump when we're all talking. Okay, so you'd lose your place to, to politics if you didn't have the dump. Um, I'm obvious. I, I'm with everybody else who's spoken so far. I'm against the pay for pay for throw or paper bag or whatever. I don't see any problem with what we have. Um, the cost to our family as a percentage of, of the total cost of the town is more than fair. Uh, we get great value out of our tax dollars and this is one of the values that we got. 32% um, recycling seems pretty good to me. Uh, I know the people in the re recycling group I'm sure are working hard at trying to get that number higher um, and uh, there's got to be a better way to do that. Um, this creates needless bureaucracy, added labor to make sure everybody pays. Seems like kind of a foolish job to pay somebody to stand there and to make sure that everybody used plastic bags that the town sold for two dollars or a dollar or three dollars or whatever it is um, when we collect property taxes anyways and uh, so I'm absolutely against it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Dave Griffin, Channel View Road. I uh, was a little get late getting here tonight, so I'm not sure whether I'm saying something that somebody had already said, but I'll try to make it brief. Uh, I'm looking at it in a different way. My question to you is, have you looked at other things besides pay, pay for throw? I did some research. Scarborough next door has a curbside pickup of trash and recyclables. Their fees, their budget for 2010 was a million seven. They have 6,800 people or 68 homes that they pick up trash. It's about 99.9% .9 of the town, excluding the commercial. Cape Elizabeth budget this year was uh, 800, right, $840,000. There's 3,700 people in town, about half the size of Scarborough. Um, if you calculate it out, um, Scarborough's paying $2.00 or $250 a year, about $5 a week for pickup. If you calculate it for Cape Elizabeth, it's about $4.60 per, per week per household. My reason for bringing this up is that it, there are other alternatives other than pay for bags, and I think we ought to be looking at them. Um, right now, there are several towns that are doing the same thing that Scarborough's doing. Uh, Cornish, Saco, Westbrook just started doing it, South Portland does it, and the canisters that they use, or the catch, whatever they call them, uh, are provided by the town. Um, if we go to the pay per bag, I'm sure other people said it, we have to go purchase the bag, we put the trash in the bag, and we still have to go to the transfer station. So basically, it's a little more increased cost for us. Um, as far as the percentage is concerned, I think we've got a long way, percentage of recycling, we've got a long way to go. Gray has a system similar to ours. People take their trash to the transfer station. They're recycling 58%. Let's and that number it was confirmed to me by one of the councillors in uh, Gray. So we do have ways to go. So after listening to some people today, I think education must be it. But also, we need to go up and look at what Gray's doing. Gray is running it almost as a business. They are selling steel, they've got a baler for their cardboard, they've got a bill for their paper, so they sell that direct to the second, second man. So I think we, we have a ways to go, and I'd rather see you take a look at that rather than make a decision. 
right now for pay, pay for throw. I think there's other ways to do it. There's some other towns are doing it uh, different ways, so we ought to look at it first before we make that decision. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My name is Tim Swartz. I don't live in Cape Elizabeth. However, I have a business providing trash removal service to Cape Elizabeth to private residents, and they hire me individually per week to, to pick up the trash. And so this affects my business, of course. I um, set up a business in such a way that a person who brings trash for me it puts it in one spot. And if they have recyclables, they separate. And they save money by, by recycling, by separating it. I still take it all away. I just know that that's the recycling. This is the trash. And I notice that um, the ones who are uh, recycling are, are conscientious. And there's a lot of them that are realizing it's a good, valuable thing to do. Um, when you put on a fee of of uh, the cost for the bag, for the trash, that's a different, that's a sort of a, um, is it versus carrot on the stick, it's, it's the stick. Um, what I'm trying to do with my business is present uh, other options, not just recycling, but so my, my opinion on the, uh, on the bag system is, is it may or may not work. I, I do know that it's happening a lot ev everywhere, that, that more, more, um, cities are moving to the cost to help people um, recycle more or use resources better. Um, I just want to present that out there that, that the commercial haulers, that I, I'm not representing a large amount of people, I'm just saying that that's what I'm doing. Coming here saying that, that in, in my, my business I realize that um, I'm trying to educate people who, who are they're giving me trash, and I can say, hey, wait, you could recycle that. You'd save money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then I also am, am educating them in several different ways. There's composting systems that I can set up. There's different ways that, that my business can help Cape Elizabeth. But what I'm saying is that I appreciate that you do want to meet the budget. Um, I just hope that it, it also... Um, in meeting the budget doesn't hurt, like like has been mentioned already, the the homeowners that have young kids that have no there's not a large income, um, but I don't know how to make that equitable. I'm just saying that uh, trying to use the carrot method of, of of getting people to do more. I my, have my website SwartzEnterprises.net, so just check it out. Um, and if you have any interest in, in getting an advocate for composting, for uh, sustainable, um, for, for using res more resources wisely, I'd be uh, willing to you know, work with you guys. But I'm just saying that um, not everybody knows about composting. Not everybody likes it or understands it. But it can be another way to reduce the trash. And it, more of a carrot method. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Robert Huff, 69 Ocean House Road in the Cape. Uh, most of everything that uh, these folks have said has, was on my mind before I got up here. Uh, generally speaking, I can see the trend is not in favor of the paper bag. Uh, I assume that the council ultimately would decide one way or the other. However, uh, this, does, this project doesn't affect just a particular section of the town or any individual. It's everybody in the town. And I would feel that uh, if it came to a decision should be put to a public vote. I don't know if that's, uh, uh, I don't know why that's not possible. I assume that it would be if, the, if that's what the town wanted. But uh, 
the, the direct benefit from my point of view is, is actually nothing. It's more work for me, it's uh, more expense for me, it looks like an open door to uh, raise the price of the bag. If, if the town office needs another computer, uh, we, can, we can grab a few more pennies from the bag. Uh, it, it looks like a, an easy way to pick our pockets, that's all. Uh, basically, uh, what other people have said in uh, opposition to this project uh, are my thoughts as well. So I won't go on. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm Eric Lusk. I live on Reef Road. And I was at the dump this past week, and I saw my friend Peter, and I thought, gosh, it's kind of strange to see my friend Peter here. Peter, don't you still live in Portland? He said, yeah, I just, I got to, you know, move some stuff out. My dump was closed. So certainly you do get the freelance garbage dumper. I mean, that's, that's kind of inescapable. It's also safe to say if you tax something, you'll get less of it. So you'll get less garbage actually coming to the transfer station, which means you'll probably get more dumped on the side of the road. So you get to weigh between my friend Peter and somebody throwing garbage off on the side of the road. Here's a few questions I'm kind of curious on. Uh, this looks like it's intended to be a dedicated revenue stream. So we've got a garbage bag receipt to offset the cost of the transfer station itself. Okay, terrific. How do we go about assigning the paper bag tax receipts or revenue receipts to go strictly for the function of paying for the transfer station itself? If we are going to have the paper bag tax or uh, revenues receipts, does that mean we're going to get rid of the cost of the transfer station from the, uh, from the property taxes themselves. It sounds to me as if we are going to be replacing one revenue stream to fund this uh, transfer station with another one. Will then property taxes go down to reflect that removal? Um, then uh, the other question I've got, and maybe I missed this someplace and you've, you've already got the answer. Um, are the costs of the transfer station rising, or are we having to take money from uh, funding the transfer station to fund some other town activity? Thanks. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Last chance. OK, thank you very much. Um, I can assure you that all the, uh, I'll declare the public hearing closed um, on uh, paper throw and trash, and I can assure you that all the counselors um, were very eager to hear what you had to say on this subject. I don't anticipate we're going to be making any decisions tonight. This was intended to be a listening session because there are lots of pluses and minuses, uh, and we have heard a multitude of opinions on uh, this subject and a, a variety of related, trash-related subjects on this. But um, I think we will um, ponder. We will listen and we will ponder. But we wanted to hear from all of you up front. Uh, and we have also heard from uh, citizens via email and, you know, just around town, too. So uh, I don't anticipate there's any decision to be made right at this moment. but. Um, the council will take your thoughts under advisement. So thank you very much. We appreciate hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Um, Mike McGovern, excuse, excuse me, I don't know if anyone wants to stay for this, but Mike McGovern uh, said there were a couple people had questions that they asked during the, um, during the uh, public hearing, and he has a couple of answers. I'll go in reverse order. There's a question, a cost of the transfer station rising? No, they're not. Uh, the cost of trash disposal declined this past year, primarily as a result of less waste 
going into the hopper and uh, more for recycling, but far more as a result of less waste uh, going into the hopper. Uh, how the town handles receipts, uh, all of the, except for some special funds, which would be for Portland Headlight, for revenues raised within Fort Williams, for the Spurwing Church and the cemetery, uh, and the rescue. Those are special revenue funds. Most of the town's revenues are revenues that accrued to the general fund as this would be. Uh, as such, all those revenues aggregate. They don't go back to the specific program. They aggregate as revenues and then it's simply used to reduce how much would otherwise be raised from property taxes. So, you know, if this happened, and I'm not sensing a whole lot of support for it, uh, but if it did happen, the revenues would, would in fact reduce the amount that would otherwise be needed for taxes. Whether or not taxes would then be spent on some other issue, you know, schools or, or whatever the issue is, I can't say. Uh, but, it, but it's definitely a bottom line reduction any of the revenues. I, I would like to comment on Mr. Berman. I don't know if he's still here, maybe not, but he had mentioned that there was an article in the, the Phoenix, uh, one of the newspapers in Portland, that said that when the rates went up in Portland, there was more trash. And, and in fact, on the roads and other issues, in fact, I did Thursday morning have a meeting with the general manager of Eco Maine as well as the public works director in Portland, the Director of Public Services, who coincidentally is the Chairman of EcoMaine right now, and he said that the last time they raised their revenues, there was definitely, which was recently, there's definitely been an impact on trash being spread around town, as well as uh, more trash being put into the silver bullets where they really don't belong. So. That, that it is issue. You know, beyond the, I, I could address some of the other issues, but I, and, I think those were the ones that really related. And, to and Mike, just to clarify, you said the last time they raised the revenues, you mean the, the price of their bag? The price of their bag. Okay. Thank yeah, you. the price of the bag went up, and there was, there's been more of a problem in the city with waste being uh, distributed around. Okay, great. Um, Sarah, and then Frank. I just have a quick question. Um, do we have any schedule for when we're going to decide this, or just it might be nice for people to know? I actually don't know. Do we, do we have a workshop, or when are we going to take it up? What we had discussed at our, what was it called, our environmental stewardships workshop, which was about six weeks ago, we had discussed back and forth many of these same issues, taxes, user fees, uh, you know, how should money be how should the, the costs of the transfer station and removing trash from our community, which is a huge number, um, be allocated? Should it be by the size of your house, the price of your house, which is the property tax method, or should it be by usage, how much trash you produce? We discussed all sorts of issues and concluded that we needed to hear more from the public. And at that time, we said we would hear more from the public and we would ponder and then at our next workshop, we would just, as I recall, we said at our next workshop, we would just think about it and think if we wanted to. We would sort of revisit it, this as a pending issue. That When's the workshop? It's not scheduled I, yet. It's not scheduled yet. We have one co uh, coming up that's pending issues within the next couple of months. I don't sense, I, I don't want to, um, I want to allay anyone's concerns that don't, uh, speaking only for myself, I don't sense that there is any great impetus on the council to decide anything on this in the next few months to just, you know, precipitously set up some new system or, you know, close the dump or do paper bag or do whatever. I, I'm speaking only for myself. That's just my sense. So don't, don't be. F don't be fearful that next week you're going to read that suddenly there's going to be paper bag. We're, we're thinking about this stuff because it's a big issue. We want to make sure we're in tune with the community. So, Frank. I just want to ask a question uh, based on some of the questions that were asked or comments that were made regarding using plastic bags to collect garbage and then <coughs> actually hurting, hurting sustainability. Are the bags that are sold uh, the, the bags would go to EcoMain and they would... Uh, be burned there. They get incinerated. They would go into the incinerator and produce power. You know, uh, there's not a large number of people, but there's some people now who, who bring their bags to the hopper and they empty their bags yeah. into the hopper and they reuse their bags. If a plan like this would be in place, 
we would not allow them to reuse their bags because of uh, they had already, you know, it, they'd already go, got their two bucks out of the bag or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> can I, Ann, can I just Annie. ask a question? Yes, go ahead, please. Because I, I would hope that within the next month to two months that we would reach a decision on pay to throw because we have heard now from citizens and we have been working on this issue since January and so I would think that we have enough facts, data and logic to make a decision within the next month or so. Yes, and what I was thinking was, I did, forgot that on page two of our agenda we have the upcoming meetings list and I see that our pending issues workshop is November 1st. Okay. So I was sort that, of thinking okay, November good. 1st. I, I was just meaning, please don't anybody fear that in, by, you know, in the next month that this is all going to get decided because it isn't, although I guess it is September, but, okay. but I would say by that workshop is sort of around when I was thinking we'd come to some sort of con consensus. Dave? Well, I, I favor that approach. It seems to me we've now had a good public input session. We've gotten a lot of emails. Um, and so I'd like us to go back to a workshop and if that could happen in early November, I think that would move it along. We don't want to keep people in suspense and I have a feeling that we're going to be taking to heart a lot of the comments. I've heard a lot of good ones tonight and that pay per throw or paper bag may not be the center of our sort of environmental stewardship plan, but it, well, I would we'll hopefully pursue other things as well. I would, I would entertain a motion if we want to formalize it for everybody to entertain a motion to, um, or I'd make a motion that we um, uh, next discuss, we the council next discuss this at our November 1st workshop uh, that is now called pending issues and this can be one of those pending issues. So moved. Any discussion? I just like to, I really liked what the person said about a comprehensive plan that's, that's even bigger than paper throw. It's about education, it's about other possibilities, it's just an environment, it's, it's um, composting. So that should be built into the, the, our workshop could cover a broader range and maybe even get someone from Cool Cape to be there. I would agree, but I don't want to raise everybody's expectations that by November 1st we're going to have. No the whole Magilla all figured out no. by then. But Just I think we'll definitely have the paper bag thing sort of figured out by then, so. Okay, did, did we vote on that? All in no, favor? Second. It was second. Oh, it, no. <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> no, all in favor. <laughs> it's unanimous. Third. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody who came out tonight. We really appreciate hearing what you had to say on this. Um, and feel free, feel free to stay if you want to stay for the rest of the meeting, but Feel free to take a moment and leave if you want to take off, too. Thank you. I'll give, I'll give the room a moment just to clear. Just the person in that booth. Yeah. That's what really needs to be done. I'll just introduce it for a second. Okay. Thank you. That brings us next to item number 109, which uh, has to do with property assessed clean energy ordinance. Mike, would you like to introduce this, please? Yeah. The state of Maine has received a rather significant grant through Efficiency Maine or Efficiency Maine Trust, whatever it's known as now, to, to help citizens with weatherization services. Part of this involves of giving loans to individuals and then putting an attachment on their property and collecting it thereafter. Uh, the state legislation gives municipalities the right to operate this program or gives the municipalities the right to say, state, we're fine if you do it. Uh, the communities that are considering this far and all of the calls that have come into Efficiency Maine, every single community in the state has, has uh, 
said, you know, the state has the staff to run this thing. Uh, there'll be consistency of answers. It'll be on a much bigger scale. And the municipalities generally have had uh, no interest to date in, in starting a new program and operating a new program. Nonetheless, if the community adopts a local ordinance saying the state can do it, citizens would have still have full access to this particular program. So it, it's, in, if you don't adopt an ordinance, citizens in Cape Elizabeth could not participate in the program. So I would encourage you to refer to the ordinance committee, the proposed new ordinance uh, called the Property Assessed Clean Energy Ordinance uh, that would enable citizens of Cape Elizabeth to access these funds uh, through the Efficiency Main Trust. Okay, thank you. Do I hear a motion? So moved, okay. I have a question. Okay, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded, question? Mike, can you give a, a little bit of a, very little bit of a description of what, would, uh, what kind of qualification, what is required of people to be eligible for? I'm curious how impactful it might be for our community. Thank you. In the material that's online and here, there's, there's frequently asked questions. And uh, you know, it, it describes different loans, it describes why it's important, it describes why the ordinances, uh, who is eligible to benefit from a PACE loan. In a town that has established a PACE program, any residential property owner is eligible to benefit from a loan so long as the, the property and its owner meet the following criteria established in the law. The homeowners have a debt to income ratio of not more than 50 percent. They're not overloaded with debt. Uh, property taxes and sewer charges are current on the property. The project's not subject to any outstanding tax or sewer liens. There's not a reverse mortgage. Uh, and there's not a notice of default, foreclosure, or delinquency which has not been cured. Uh, and the, the actual energy improvements need to meet standards for uh, payback. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Jessica. So what, what happens with this? This, this would, you're recommending that, that this go to the Ordinance Committee. Yeah. The Ordinance Committee would review it and then recommend back to the Council yeah. any action? And then there'd be a public hearing and okay. the Council would adopt or not adopt the ordinance as proposed by the Ordinance Committee or as you did tonight on the tree ordinance with amendments as you choose. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? But this, as proposed, and I haven't read all of the details of it, there's no cost associated with the Cape Elizabeth. That's the intent, is to place the entire administrative burden on, this, on efficiency main trust. And with this, and I'm just trying to anticipate questions, does this in any way uh, lead to the possibility of higher state taxes to support this program? You know, I don't determine long-term policy for the state of Maine, <laughs> but uh, you should. You should. <laughs> should. The, state, the state of Maine uh, has received a grant uh, to do this, and Efficiency Maine Trust is a brand new state agency. came into place on July 1. Uh, Efficiency Maine used to be part of the PUC and is now separate, and uh, it appears to have good leadership. Uh, I think John Brodigan is This, the this money came from federal stimulus money, and yeah. the idea is that it's sort of a 10-year revolving loan, so once it gets going, assuming everybody keeps paying it off the way it's supposed to, it will keep going. So that's the theory, at least. Michael, do you have any sense of how many, how many citizen towns in Maine are going to go forward with putting an ordinance like this in place? It's too early to tell. We've been lobbied heavily to get the process moving by you know people interested in energy conservation and people interested in seeing this grant be successful uh, you know i can't predict what all the councils and boards of selectmen will do and obviously in some meeting ta town meeting towns to drop an adopt an ordinance requires a little more more work my guess is some will begin to do it it'll stall out because of procedural issues the legislature will probably slightly amend the law when it comes back in in December, the new legislature in January, just to make sure uh, it's it's at ease. Th this ordinance is drafted as the model ordinance that the state recommended, with okay. you know Cape Elizabeth substituted for city of Trent. Any other? Yes, Jim. yeah. I mean, I I'd be interested in attending the ordinance committee meeting to just when this comes up because 
<clears throat> there, I have a lot of questions on it. I mean, they, they, they seem to be actually fairly unorganized. They don't know what interest rates they're going to be charging. They don't know. The, the Maine has gotten this grant because they, they've uh, proposed a revolving loan situation, but um, if, the, if anybody or any large number of people default on these loans, then there is no more income. And I mean, there are a lot of questions with this. Possibly uh, the municipality, as I read it, could end up being uh, assigned as an agent on the part of the trust. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of questions with this. Yeah, it's, it's, there's also, you know, a workshop coming up that I'll send you a notice of it, uh, you know, that yeah. describes in, in more detail with meeting with the different state officials. It's, it's a, I didn't specifically mention, it's a $20 million grant program. Okay. Yeah. Is that sound? Okay. It turned it off. Someone's phone maybe. <laughs> mine's like off. I promise, mine's off. Thought the fog foghorn was approaching. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. I can't even remember after we that. Did, did, did we? Seconded, but we haven't voted. Okay, let's vote on it. All in favor? Okay, it's going to go off to the Ordinance Committee. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that explanation. Okay, um, item number 110 has to do with personal property tax accounts. Uh, which I don't know who Mike or Deborah who wants to introduce well, you this. Do you want to do it? Okay. Uh, Deborah is our de facto tax collector, uh, even though she doesn't have the title, uh, and uh, works very hard at collecting all of our taxes. Uh, real estate taxes, we put liens on property, we collect eventually, you know, about 100%. Uh, Personal property sometimes are tougher to collect, particularly when they're businesses that are no longer here. Uh, Deborah recently looked at all of the personal property taxes that have been unpaid since fiscal year 2004. This is fiscal year 2010. Uh, there's a total unpaid since then that we believe is uncollectible, either in, in one case of $121 because it wasn't assessed right, which sometimes happens, uh, and then the, the balance of them are, are businesses that are no longer here. Uh, we went to great effort to collect one of them. Uh, that's eight hundred eleven dollars and seventy three cents. Uh, right now, we think we're we're throwing uh, good money after bad. Uh, the total of all of these is twelve hundred thirty five dollars and ninety six cents. We actually did a calculation, and in, in the recommendation is to abate this. But the amount that we collected of the amount billed this during this period is actually ninety nine point nine 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 two percent if this is abated. So, you know, if folks read this and think it's easy to get out from paying taxes, it's, it's really not, because that's an infinitesimal decimal. <laughs> so uh, the, the recommendation of the, of the tax collector uh, is to uh, abate uh, the amount shown in your memo dated September 3rd, uh, as indicated. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion or questions? David. I don't want to identify the business openly here. Of course, it's all a public record. But the, the business that's ignored a court order to pay the taxes, can you give me any background on that? I... Yeah, that was a laundromat that was once down here at the shopping center, now does business on Broadway in South Portland, uh, right uh -huh. next to Angeloni's. Uh, I'm a customer, so. Yep. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> how long can you, how many ways can you get out of that shirt, Dave? <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, it, is there, was there some sort of argument made that this wasn't done properly, or is it just simply we're not going to pay because we're not in CAPE anymore? I can't speak for the individual, but All right. I never heard any of those arguments. Okay, well, I may ask myself next time I'm at that place of business. <laughs> Okay. Jim. Can you sell this debt to a collector for 25 cents on the dollar or whatever? I mean, I just wonder if it's something you could sell to someone. You know, other towns do that. 
that's fine. Uh, but not, they generally don't do it for personal property tax, and these outfits usually aren't too interested in doing it for $1,200 for, you know, this many different accounts. Just curious. Yeah. That has been done in other places. Frank. Uh, does abatement mean write-off? Yes. And does it mean that we will not try to uh, pursue this for just forgetting about it because it's not worth the time and money? Yes. We, we actually did write to all of the ones that had local connections uh, about two months ago. And there were a couple, this list was a little bit longer. And there were three accounts, was it, or mm -hmm. two? Two or three, yeah. Three accounts actually paid. And, you know, we, we sort of said, you know, we're going to reveal it and disclose it. You might get bad publicity. Uh, and they responded and paid. We appreciate that. Of course, we're not mentioning who does No, no, no we, we, you don't get that so list. You're, you're not getting it. <laughs> no, no, no. We said if they paid up, it, they wouldn't show no, up. No, I, mean, I mean, to the ones. The no, we that said didn't pay. No, we the said ones they wouldn't be on the bad. The, yeah, yeah the, bad. the ones that didn't pay, we gave them until a certain date and said if you don't pay by a certain date, it's going to be a public record and uh, okay. it might be embarrassing. Okay. Sarah, did you have a question? That was Frank's question. Okay. Jess, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> is there any mechanism uh, or does any record stay in place that should any of the uh, business owners of these desire in the future? to open a business of Cape Elizabeth, is there any connection to a tax ID number so that in order to do that, should that occur, they would have to take care of There is not. Payment? There is not. Okay. Is, there, is there a, I mean, it's a small amount of money. Is there an amnesty opportunity? You say, hey, come in and pay this, and we're going to forgive all the late charges and interest fees? Just a question. That's what we already offered. And that didn't work? No, we got three of them. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> and, and one of these, I should point out, it was no longer owned by the party, the one about the third one down. So that that one, you know, he's no, he wasn't responsible for it to begin with. Sarah? I think in light of all the enormous amount of work that Lane has to do, that we should take this off her desk. <laughs> No, I, I, I agree um, I mean, with that. I mean, this is so and much work for so little. It's just as somebody who frequents one of these businesses, I find it a bit galling. Yet I, I know these folks, they're wonderful people. They have kids in the school system. They're uh, supporters of a lot of uh, efforts around town. And so, you know, I'm certainly going to chat with them, but I think we should take it off the list. Pick your shirts up first. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have no worries about that. $811. Okay. Um, uh, it's, been, it's been moved and seconded. Anything anybody else wants to say? No? All in favor of abating these? Jim, is your hand up? Yes? Okay. Yes, it's unanimous. And thank you, Deb, for all your hard work on this. Okay, um, item number 111 has to do with the comprehensive plan. The uh, item is described that we, uh, the council met in workshop, workshop format um, last week, I think it was last week, uh, having to do with land use amendments and then there was also discussion of the, compre the 2007 comprehensive plan then and we said at that workshop uh, our consensus was to have a discussion this evening relating to implementation of the 2007 Comprehensive Plan. Mike McGovern had uh, put together a memorandum which was part of the pre-work for uh, this packet in which he had made some recommendations. And then uh, later this afternoon, I don't know if everybody had a chance to see it. I see that um, I didn't see it till after 5. Uh, Frank Governale had sent out an email um, with some of his thoughts. But so, uh, we're to have a discussion. 
I don't know if, if the motion is let's have a discussion, whatever, or we just can have a discussion. Usually we don't discuss things unless we have a motion. I'd be happy to make a motion. Okay, go ahead, Dave. I would move that we adopt the recommendations as outlined in the town manager's memorandum dated August 22, 2010, and there are eight listed recommendations on the last page of that memo. And that's what I'm referring to. Okay. And just so people in the audience know what that is, that's the, um, the one that, the uh, memo that was part of the pre-work for the PAC tonight. Okay. Is there a second for that? Jessica. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. David, do you want to say why you are making that motion? Um, I uh, thought the memorandum was very well done uh, and I actually appreciate the fact that the town manager waited until after we had held the workshop um, because I understood his position was not wanting to sort of weigh in too early until there had been an opportunity to have at least that session and have the council discuss among themselves how they may wish to proceed. Uh, it, it seemed to me that the uh, implementation steps in the comprehensive plan that the town manager was recommending we put on the back burner. It, it made sense to place on the back burner given all that we've learned about uh, growth projections uh, in the last several weeks uh, and yet it would allow the planning board to move forward with some important implement, implementation steps in the comprehensive plan and um, certainly I think it makes sense to revisit some of the land use impl implementation steps in 2012 once we've done some work on other aspects of the comprehensive plan. So that was my overall feeling. I appreciated the work that Frank put into his proposal. My concern in reading that was it seemed like a lot of these steps may even be beyond the purview of the planning board. They seem more sort of policy setting. Um, and I am more than willing as a town council goal for next year to consider a lot of what Frank had placed in, in his memorandum, but it, it seemed to me it was asking perhaps too much of the planning board and maybe was sort of beyond uh, what I view as their sort of mission or authority. It, okay. It, it, Jim? Is there a way that you can take what Frank has, and it seems as though what Frank has done is he's synthesized a lot of what's been written by citizens in email fashion, but also what he's heard directly, as well as what we've heard. Is there a way that you can take parts of what Frank has and what Michael has recommended and collapse the documents and make sure that we've covered all the bases, that we've effectively got a working document and a directive to the planning board that is as comprehensive as we as a group can have. Um, because I, I think there are pieces about what he's asking. While I see the policy components of it, I do think that it, it does kind of uh, put a, a, a larger, more, um, call it a 50,000 foot view on what it is that we're asking to be done. And I, I just wonder if there's a way that, rather than rush to a decision tonight about the document that Michael's prepared, that we take the two documents, good work on, on the part of both individuals, and see if there's a way to collapse it so that we can make sure that the decision that we make and the work plan that we generate for our planning board is exactly what it is we ask them to do. I'm just concerned that, you know, it's good, good information. I mean, I mean, this is fabulous work. I mean, and I just would hate to have us not sort of put that into our current thinking. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I appreciate what, what the manager put together, and I also appreciate what Frank put together, too. Um, I, I tend to think, I think there's a lot of stuff of value in both documents. I tend to agree more with David in that um, I'm, su I'm supporting his motion, but I don't want to lose all the stuff that Frank has talked about. But I, a concern I have with 
the, uh, the, the Frank uh, the, the Frank document, or, <laughs> for the Frank doctrine, whatever you want to call it for the moment, um, is that it's very focused on the planning board. And the implementation steps in the open space and recreation chapter of the comp plan are all, are all um, they don't have to do with the planning board. Those were all responsibilities because they're, they're, they're at a policy level. Most, most of them are at a policy level. They were all things that the council, uh, they, they were felt important enough so that the council would be um, working on those. So they were assigned to the town council. There, was, there were a few that had the Conservation Commission, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, and community services when we talked about some of the master plans underneath. Um, dealing with those implementation steps. I have absolutely no concern. I think it's a good idea, in fact, for the council to add uh, or, or put right up front in our council goal setting, which is coming up within you know, two months, um, of, of looking at all this recreation and open space stuff. I think, as uh, Dave mentioned, the a lot of the heat and urgency has gone out of the, the land use uh, issue in terms of the numbers. The numbers are changing, have changed significantly. We aren't looking at a projection, a three-year-old projection looking forward of 330 units of, of uh, housing that might have to be developed over the, until 2020. Uh, now we're looking at 38 houses by 2020. I mean, we're looking at three or four houses a year. Uh, and I would really prefer, I think we'll have new census documentation, 2010, 2010 census data, hard data available in December of uh, 2010, only a couple months from now. I think we'll have that um, that will inform us. We have this updated planning decisions information. Um, I don't want to start sort of rewriting the comp plan and who's doing what and revising things and doing all that stuff. Just to, and just, I just want to defer some steps for, for a while. Um, and I think, I think we should add the recreation and open space tasks, but I think they're council tasks because I think they're policy making tasks. I think they're things that need to get the whole town involved. And um, I'm, I'm sensitive to adding, uh, after I'm meeting with the, the planning board the other night, I'm sensitive to adding uh, to their workload when they, when they were already talking about, you know, they've got, they got a million things of their own to do. And they, um, <coughs> I think this is sort of beyond their purview, so that's why I'm thinking what I'm thinking. Right. As I approached this uh, and, and thought about it, it was really building upon what Mike had already proposed and reviewing um, the variety of emails we received and, and looking into the comp plan a little more. Uh, sort of taking. Sorry. Um, as Jim said, sort of taking a 50,000, 30,000 foot view of this, it seemed to me that uh, perhaps what, what I proposed is much broader than the uh, specific purview of the uh, planning board. However, the breadth, um, as you look through it, the breadth of it suggests that we sort of are looking at these things in, in, in the wrong order. That, that the open space planning, because it is such an important part of what everyone in town believes in and why they're here and the priorities they set, that it really should look, be looked at first, what be defined, and if it goes beyond what the planning board has responsibility for, then let's identify that portion which goes beyond the planning board's responsibility, allocate it to the town council, but address this first, rather than address any of the elements of the land use. As you said, there is no urgency. And unless we get the open space element of this correct, we're bound to make, we, we, we can easily make mistakes on the, um, on the land use side. Because in reality, the land use should be derivative 
of the open space planning. Until we know what the priority parcels are in our town, until we know what the priorities are for the, the, our ability to protect, enhance, conserve those properties are, <clears throat> making any decisions at all on using those properties seems to me putting the cart before the horse. So I, I'm, I'm questioning why there is a difficulty with saying, okay, planning board, move ahead with open space, deal with those things that you have the ability to deal with, let's figure out what you don't have the ability to deal with, put that into the town council's hands, use it as a, um, uh, the, uh, use it to develop our goals for uh, next year. Once we've achieved all that, once we've addressed the specific objectives in the land use chapter and perhaps some other objectives that I've listed in my recommendation, then let's worry about the land use. Yeah, I, I guess my response would be I don't have any problem with the timing, the order. It's the planning board versus the town council thing because I look at these these um, uh, implementation steps or whatever they're called on the list and it's it's things like evaluating funding methodologies, it's work, uh, evaluating long-term financing via bonds to do land purchases, uh, purchase easements, partner with the land trust, encourage the state of Maine to acquire permanent public access to Crescent Beach, right. you know, blah, blah, blah. It goes on a bunch of, there's a bunch of things like that. Um, these, these are not planning board things. These are town council things. So it's the, t I'm sorry. Okay. It's the, it's the town council versus the planning board part of it I'm having. But I don't think, I don't have any concern about moving forward with the few things, these eight recommendations that David referenced, um, some of them are recommendations to just not do things. I mean, it's sort of like they're, they're recommendations to just don't go forward, ask the planning board to defer recommendations about uh, multiplex housing units. So we don't worry about multiplex. Uh, defer recommendations to increase density bonuses. So we're not going to be doing anything with density bonuses. Um, there are a couple of things in there that I do think I would like to have the planning board look at sooner. And that one of those is the uh, looking at the when we do get open space right now, developers can fulfill some of the open space stuff with these little skinny strips of land that are sort of useless. They're not really open space. They're more like pathways um, through lots. Oh, excuse me. And um, we, we want a higher quality, like a bigger chunk space. And I, I'd hate to sort of wait on something like that. Um, and. You know, some of these other things are asking the town manager to refocus the staff resources on non-regulatory implementation steps in the comp plan. I mean, the, the recommendations in, in David's motion have to do with things that are not just land use, too. There are other comp plan things, too. So I think there's a way of doing that motion, but then also getting at all your concerns. I don't agree with every single premise you, you make here, but we can pound out all that stuff in workshops or whatever. And we can figure out consensus as to what the council thinks. Um, but some of these things have, have already been done, but my major concern is who's doing them. And I think we're going to get right to that point this fall. We're going to be starting our goal setting and our planning. This, this could and I think should be major <coughs> a major chunk of the planning goal setting for what the council what the council does. I just don't want to put it in the hands of the planning board because so much of it is policy related stuff. I don't, I, I'll get to you in a second. No, no, Sarah, Sarah's, Sarah's, you, Sarah's first. Sarah and then Mike, you had some comment you wanted to make? It, it seems to me that I agree with Frank that he took what Mike said and built upon it. So I don't think that they're two separate things. Essentially, Mike said, let's do it in the reverse order. Let's cope with the, the open space provisions and the other things, and that will drive the land use. And I agree with that. And then Frank said, okay, what would it look like to put it first, and what, what were the specifics that we would need to look at, which I think was very helpful. So it seems almost artificial to be debating, to be doing it in a parallel way because the planning board, again, I feel like we're giving them no direction. Like, 
Is it a policy? If it is, in fact, Frank's document, more of a policy issue, should the council then maybe wrestle with it a little bit and tease out what should be the purview of the planning board? Or I think even more preferable would be to wait till the council hashes out exactly what it wants in an overview and a policy way and then hand it to the planning board, or we're just going to sort of be wasting the planning board's time. So I just don't see what we're going to hand the planning board that's helpful, they're going to be doing work that we may later say, oh, that wasn't really what we wanted, or actually we've decided this, or we're having two separate groups do parallel work not talking to each other that appears to me to make no sense. If it's, a, if it's an umbrella policy we need to come up with, then let's pause in sending it to the planning board. So I like Jim's idea to roll these two documents into one and have and wait until then, until the council can then say, okay, let's hand it to the planning board. I, I, Although I appreciate what Mike did, and I think it was a great jumping off point, there are things I don't agree with, and I wouldn't want a wholesale vote for it tonight. For example, I don't like number six. I think it's an artificial deadline. I don't understand why it's there, and I think it's, it makes no sense. Maybe, it may be six months we can start take up the land use section if we're all done with the open space, or maybe the open space is going to take two years. It, it, why wait till 2012? So I don't know how we can, we can combine them right now, or we can take part of a workshop or whatever, but I'm not in favor of sort of saying, okay, planning board, do what you can, because I feel like that's, again, wasting their time. Um, I'd rather have more specifics to hand them. So I really like Jim's idea if we can do that somehow. Penny. A couple of points. Uh, first, um, the document developed by Mike uh, references um, asking the planning board to closely review implementation steps which encourage the preservation of working farms. Um, if we were to vote on this document, I would suggest that we take them item by item because I truly would not support that as a part of the recommendation. Secondly, I agree with Sarah a hundred percent and with Jim that I think what we need to do is take the two documents we need to reconcile them and tease out what are the elements that the town council uh, would focus on and what are the elements that we're passing along to the planning board and we need to know it based on these two documents exactly what we are uh, charging each group to do uh, and thirdly, what I would suggest is that no matter what happens, we need to engage uh, representatives from the various organizations across town to truly help us understand, whether it be um, uh, open space from a generic sense, uh, agricultural properties and what we want to have that uh, look like, where, where are our important uh, uh, tracts of land, what are their uses, and really engage the community in it. And those are, I, those are my three things that I would look at. Great. Thank you. Dave? It, it's really hard, uh, to, and I think everybody would agree with me, that it would be hard to sort of do this tonight as we're sitting here to try to tease these things together. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out, well, if that's what the council wants to do, uh, where would we do that? And I think it might, might even be hard in a, another workshop of the entire council. And so I'm wondering, I don't want to create more work for the Ordinance Committee, <laughs> but Frank is actually on the Ordinance Committee, as is Jim and, and me, and I'm wondering if we, we were to try to hold a, a meeting that's obviously open to the public and with the uh, there are new rules, there would be opportunity for folks to participate, mm -hmm. but we could try to see if there's a way to tease this together. I, I don't view these two sets of recommendations as inconsistent, no. and I actually would, would be more in favor of asking the planning board to move forward on, on m hopefully all of these recommendations, or most of them, um, because I, I, I do think if I, if I read through these implementation steps that follow all the goals in the open space and recreation section, that except for maybe one of them, they're all town council. Uh, and I would be happy to focus on that as a, a major goal for, for the coming year. So I'd rather we move forward with the memo as, as Mike had drafted, but if we're not going to do that, 
I just would be curious to hear what the other folks in the council think about sort of what the next step would be. Because it's really, the larger the group, the harder it is to try to meld things together. It's just my two cents. Mike has been waiting. I've forgotten. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little handicapped here because I didn't get a copy of Frank's memo, so oh. I have no idea what it says. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Frank. But, I apologize for that. Why no, it's, I didn't get it. So, uh, you know, I'd like to suggest sort of a compromise between the two. Uh, I, I want to read the memo. Uh, I, I want to understand it because, you know, I think if you begin any process and your staff hasn't seen it and doesn't understand it, you, you start off not too far ahead. Uh, not, not that the staff... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but what, what I'd like to do is to meet with Frank and to see if there's some way that the two of us can do it, then to ensure everything's public, then it, to go to the Ordinance Committee. And maybe, you know, if, if we come up with something that begins to interweave it, I think it, it makes the, the ease of it understanding a lot more for the Ordinance Committee than just going into the Ordinance Committee and, you know, no one understanding. Yeah. They, they, this, I think it would really help with some merger work to go on and not be done by a three-member committee. Although, you know, the three-member committee can spend all the time they want looking at the, the initial product. Mm -hmm. Sarah, then Jessica, then, oh, did I skip you, Penny? Sorry. Then Penny. Sarah. Not to be disrespectful, but I think the Ordinance Committee is the perfect body to do this, and I have complete faith that they could do it, but I have a suggestion as you go. Or maybe you would, the Ordinance Committee and Mike or something, I don't know. Anyway, to save people time. Maybe you could make three lists. These are the things the council should be dealing with in whatever format, another workshop, whatever. These are the things that can go straight to the planning board because they're under their purview. And these are the things that would be very well addressed by Penny's community committee, which I think is also a really great idea. There's so many people with so much passion and talent over this issue that should be brought to the table. And then everybody's marching forward in the same direction at the same time communicating with each other. That's just a suggestion. You could have three pieces of paper and assign tasks as you go. A uh, couple things. Who, who ultimately determines the zoning definition of land in Cape Elizabeth. Who ultimately decides this is RA, RB, or whatever? The town Council. Okay. That's what I thought. So my, I, I read your, your uh, email, Frank, you know, late this afternoon, right before I came. I, I read it once, and I went over a few parts. And I, I you know, I'm in favor of, of approving uh, the town manager's recommendations. I think that um, they're comprehensive. He's asking the planning board to defer some of these steps, which I think is very wise, and I'm, I'm very happy with that. What I take from your, um, your letter and your recommendations really is, and, and, and I'm, I'm actually rather sympathetic to them, but it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you're really getting at is we look at open space first, and, and then that will just, everything else flows from that. But you're really looking at, at rezoning parcels of lands to RA. You, you, it looks like you want to add a lot more rural definition and tighten up uh, or restrict, possibly, uh, use of parcels with it, what, you know, you mentioned strategic conservation plan and things like that. I mean, I, it looks like you're wanting to, to um, uh, further um, restrict the use of some of these rural areas in a way to protect them. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a very good point, uh, or raising a good point. And I think it, it, but it highlights one of the issues here. On the one hand, we want to preserve land. On the other hand, uh, farmers in, in town have a very difficult time operating on a sustainable basis. And the, their land is prim their primary source of wealth. And so it raises the issue, on the one hand, we want to help them, we want to do whatever we can to make them, their operations sustainable. On the other hand, we can't rob them of the wealth that they, that the only wealth in many cases that they have. So it's a conundrum. And what it suggests to me is that kind of an issue has to be dealt head on. How do we deal with something like that? We need resource, we need, I mean, there's lots of people who have dealt with that kind of an issue in the state, around the country. How is that dealt with? What's the most effective way of achieving all of our goals? 
And it seems to me, unless you address that head on, and not as a derivative product of our land use, our land use uh, effort, that you're missing an opportunity to get it right. And also you're potentially harming the people you're, you're ultimately trying to protect. Well, and I, and I agree in theory because, and I, but I, I see this as, as uh, so uh, critically important that we must take very careful diligent steps and not rush and not try to, you know, and, and try to go along with, you know, Anne and I think David's recommendations because, you know, ultimately um, you could have a situation where by, uh, and again, I, I want things to remain open, but I also see other, other problems such as um, people losing the value of their land if, if, if it's so restricted because people want to remain of use. And again, I want it to remain open, but I'm, I'm seeing lots of, of, I guess, unintended consequences or what have you. And I think that it's, it really is important for us to be very careful to go forward under the, under the structure that we have. The comprehensive plan that we have is, 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 is very, it's, it's very comprehensive. We have, I mean, I read through the open space um, chapter today. And I, I think the process is there. I don't think we have to jam through and reinvent the wheel. And that's my concern. I just I don't, don't want it to be. I think it's just, just the opposite. Just the opposite. Right. Yeah. Oh, yes. Penny's, Penny's next. Sorry. Penny. I'm going to go back to um, taking logical steps to uh, reconcile the documents. Number one, I agree that um, uh, Mike McGovern and, and Frank Governelli need to get together and discuss the two documents and merge them together um, as much as possible. And then, yes, we do need a subgroup and the ordinance committee. It makes sense that they are the ones that would be next. And then from that, I would anticipate that the ordinance committee would say, here's what we have done. Here's what we're putting in front of the council. Here are the three buckets, as uh, Sarah has outlined. And here's how we propose that we go forward with this. And that, to me, is what makes the most sense. And I, and I don't think it's trying to jam something through. I think it's, as Frank has said, uh, and Sarah and others, it's less step back less know what we're making decisions on, and less answer those big questions that uh, are not always addressed, that's kind of the elephant in the room. And I think we need to hit them head on. And I think that's what's being suggested. David. I'm the one who suggested that the Ordinance Committee might be the right body. I, I agree with basically Penny, but Penny outlined as the steps, which is echoing what Mike McGovern suggested. Is it just, what I'm trying to figure out is, is that an appropriate role for the Ordinance Committee to play? Typically, the Town Council votes to have the Ordinance Committee review a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance. And here, it's, it's a little different. And it seems to me logical to have that happen, and I'm happy for us to do it, but I just want to be sure that that's I, the I, right thing. I think that the rest of, well, speaking only for myself, but I think that the rest of the Council would be very happy to have the Ordinance Committee take that role. I, I, I agree with Penny, too, that um, I, I think, echoing what Mike said, I think the two documenters, the, 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 the two authors get together. There's a lot of overlap and, and sure. whatever. Get, get your document together, sort of. So, so there's one document. It's really hard to wordsmith. And a big, the bigger the group gets, the harder it is to talk about it, let alone try to wordsmith it. You guys get the document together and then go take it to the Ordinance Committee. And I feel confident that the Ordinance Committee will have uh, a, a broad representation of view on the Council. I feel like the Ordinance Committee is sort of a balanced view of the Council, too. And so we'll come to it that way. And then it'll come to the whole Council. And at every step along the way, there's going to be a chance for the, the public to weigh in. Um, per our new rules and, and ordinance committee meetings are open to the public too. So, you know, everybody wants to weigh in that way. I think there will be, there's no, the thing I just want to keep emphasizing is there's no, like, 
really super, super duper rush, rush, rush to this. I mean, it's important, so we should do it and get to it. But I think that 330 unit thing was freaking people out. And now when I hear it's four houses a year, which is lower than what it's been the last, I don't know, eight years or whatever, I'm just not feeling the sense of urgency and freak out. I, I'm not feeling it myself. And so I, I feel it's better for us to do this in a thoughtful, comprehensive way. And I'm perfectly comfortable with, you know, looking at the bigger picture, the open space recreation stuff first. Again, you know, my concern, which will get pounded out somewhere along the way, I don't know where it'll come out on, is the who's, who's doing what on this. But I think a lot of that will come out as it flows through this process that Penny has, has outlined. So um, we do have a motion on the table. I don't know if you want to withdraw your motion or if you want to vote on it and then make another motion to do this new process or what? I think it makes more sense for me to withdraw the motion. I'm hearing a general consensus among the council that they're happy with the uh, Penny Jordan approach. Um, so I'd like, and the well, it's an approach that we've all sort of come sort to of the, together. Sort of the domino uh, consensus. So, uh, uh, so I'm happy to try to make a new motion. Okay, if, go ahead and make a new motion, <laughs> please. Um, I'd like to move that uh, prior to uh, this matter going to the uh, ordinance committee for further deliberation that the town manager and councilor Governale get together to see if there is a way for them to try to meld the town manager's memorandum dated August 22, 2010, with the action items that are set forth in Frank Governale's uh, memorandum dated September 13, 2010, that if the two of them could then create a document for the Ordinance Committee to consider, we would then hold a public meeting. Obviously, that document would be made available for public review prior to the Ordinance Committee meeting. Uh, then the Ordinance Committee would be charged with uh, making a recommendation to the council for next steps. That is probably the worst motion I've ever made. It's yeah. good. But, <laughs> but, but, may, may I try to help? Yes. Thank I'd you. recommend you simply refer this issue to the ordinance committee, yeah. and the rest of it I think is all instructive, and we'll try to accomplish. I mean, that's a simple approach, and I just hope people understand that that's what would be happening yeah. as we yeah. get to that ordinance committee meeting. I think the, cl the cleaner motion is simply refer it to the ordinance. So the yeah. the motion is to refer it to the ordinance committee, but. We all understand that the steps are two yes, of you we'll meet, yeah. Yeah. do your thing, then it goes to the ordinance committee, then the council as a whole yeah. will consider it. With, with the understanding with that. With the public being able to weigh in along the way. And with the understanding is the document that comes out of our meeting will be at least a week before the ordinance committee, so anyone can look at it and know what the ordinance committee will be discussing. And, and do we know when then it, do we? You'll send us an e email or something. Of when the, I, I'm not on the Ordinance Committee, so I have no idea when the Ordinance Committee is meeting. So, so someone will let us know, if, in case anybody we, wants to we, show up. For hope here. <laughs> we we uh, typically uh, try to come up with a date that works for the three of us and the town and the, the town manager and the town planner, and we'll certainly make sure there's plenty of notice. Okay. And we do okay. have another issue on our plate. Uh, the well. My memory is like a sieve, but we will definitely get to this. I, I, was, I was just going to impulsively say roosters or something like no. that, but I figured no, I should not. I might make one comment, having had a chance to look at this. To me, it's more a matter of groupings of, you know, yeah. this is the group that you're referring to, the planning board, the instruction, and then there's some other things in here, as I read it quickly, that, that are really right. council directives, council, you know, this is the direction we want to go, and maybe a statement of direction that the council would consider or something. Okay. How that all works out, I'm not sure. Yeah. There's a citizen. Well, all those things. All those things. So wait, we don't have a second, though, do we? No, we, no I was just going to. Second, second. It's now been seconded, but so keep talking. I just have a quick talking. question. Yes. I get the whole thing, but it, when you recommend it back to the council, what is that? Will we be like this and we'll just say we like the whole thing or can we change X, Y, and Z? Will we sort of approve each section and where it's going and a mild timeline or how's, what's it going to look well, like? Well, I have a feeling. This is just a feeling, but I have a feeling by the time we get through the memo merging, the ordinance committee, then it getting to us, there'll be a workshop coming along. Because this is not the kind of thing to try and do in this kind of a meeting. There's got to be workshops so we can discuss. And there's no 
big rush, as Councillor Walsh is pointing out. There's no big rush. This is a big, important thing. So we want to just do it right. So, Dave. And if this motion does pass, then we need to communicate to the planning board as well. Yeah. That I'm assuming they're going to continue to have the pause button hit until we get back to them. Is that right? I would assume so. Okay. Are you, I'm not hearing anybody say anything different. Is there anything else? Hopefully it's coming to you. Know, Michael, Michael, please speak up if I'm there's just, something we're forgetting. Well, it's, you know, you gave earlier instructions to the planning board. Mm -hmm. The planning board participated at your workshop. Mm -hmm. You know, absent any direction, they can do whatever they please. And, you know, I can't say 100% one way or the other what they may or may not do. Well, perhaps, what? perhaps it could be communicated to them that this is our plan. You know, just this is what we're doing. We're going to do this memo merging ordinance committee workshop kind of thing because they're in, probably interested. But so far, there are no specific direct marching orders from the council. I mean, there have not been any votes that I know of that have said, do this, do that. And just based on the sentiments of the chairman of the planning board, I, I just can't believe that they would move forward simply because they're volunteers, they're citizens, they have other responsibilities. <laughs> I don't if, think they're going to move forward not. until they really get the, the clear direction from us. And you can keep him posted as you go. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah. yeah. David, maybe if you could just call him or your chair of ordinance and you work with him to set up that. Um, I'd be happy to. The, uh, the agenda the other night, that would be helpful. Penny. Can I just ask a question for clarification? Mike, when you say they can do whatever they please, can you explain why you made that statement? <laughs> yeah, I'll try to. Uh, I listened to a lot of different opinions at the workshop, mm -hmm. and in particular, I, I listened very closely to the planning board, and they have some strong feelings in this area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, absent specific direction, uh, you, know, I, you know, I don't think they'd work on it, but, you know, they have the right to. And, you know, some of them, as they get into other issues, they might lap into these areas. But that said, you know, I, I don't, don't think they're going to work. It is part of their mission for them. If yeah. they see something that they want to make a recommendation to us about, mm -hmm. they will. But I also caught a strong flavor of... Yeah. We got plenty of work to why do. You, why so. would you want to create angst in the community if you don't need to? That's kind of my question. Oh. Yeah. I just, I don't speak for the planning board. They're, okay. they're an independent group. Okay. I, you know, absent direction, they're, they're a body that can move in the directions that they choose. Okay, I think we need to vote on this one. And the, the motion, I think we all understand the different steps of it, but the motion is to revert, refer this to the Ordinance Committee. So, all in favor. It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good discussion, everyone. Thank you. Um, our next item is item 112, which is a request for a hardship abatement. This is a property owner that has asked for an abatement of property taxes by reason of infirmity or poverty. So, pursuant to 36 MRSA section 841.2.G, applications are confidential and hearings and reviews on any such requests are held in executive session. The decision will be made on this item will be made in public, but without disclosing the identity of the applicant. Before we, yes, before we um, go into executive session, however, <laughs> the audience is leaving. Um, I wanted to say that we have a second opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. So if there's anybody who'd like to speak on an item not on the agenda, please come forward. Seeing no one, we've got no one there. So we're not going to adjourn yet. I just want to remind people upcoming meetings, while well, we're still on camera, we have a finance committee meeting with regard to an audit presentation October 4th. Uh, we have a town council workshop with regard to Fort Williams Park, also on October 4th. Our next regular town council meeting is October 13th. Then we have a workshop on pending issues, one of which will be pay per throw.
or paper bag on November 1st, and then we go on with some of our regular meetings. Our next workshop after that is December 6th, in which we will start our start or be doing our council goal setting. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Do I hear a motion for us to go into executive session? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Um, okay, so we're going to turn off the cameras and we'll be going into an executive session. We will come into public session to make our decision, but we'll be off camera.